The planet needs a grand plan. You've got the slow death of industry, the squeezing of the middle classes, and a population with finite resources available that's still burning through fossil fuels like there's no tomorrow. You need a grand plan, says uh, with uh, France's president learning that the hard way when he piecemeal tried to implement a carbon tax on fuel at the pump. The Yellow Vest movement was born with a mantra that could read, we too want to save the planet, but why should it be only the little guy who pays? A grand plan? Well, that's what progressive Democrats in Washington claim. 29-year-old first-term Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal could come up for a vote in the U.S. Senate as early as this week. It spells out uh, ideas to convert homes and businesses uh, while protecting the still nascent renewable energy industry from outside competition until it's matured enough to fend for itself. We're going to be asking if the likes of China, perhaps Germany, don't already have green new deals and what Europe as a whole is going to do about all of this. We'll also ask about the cost, a cost as big as the plan is grand. How to pay for it? What's the alternative? to thinking big on this one. Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering, is it time for a Green New Deal? Joining us from New York City, journalist Kate Aronoff, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. From Berkeley, California, Michael Schellenberger, energy and environment journalist at Forbes magazine. Welcome to the show. With us Thanks for having me. In the studio, Walid Weslati, senior economist at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Thanks for being with us. Uh, energy and transport consultant Nicolas Miron, welcome back to the show. Hi, good morning. And sitting next to you is uh, France 24 science editor Mairead uh, Dundas, uh, who joins us uh, for the beginning bit here. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, it could be up for a vote in the Senate as early as this week. The Green New Deal touted as much more than an environmental protection bill. The Green New Deal is not my legislation. The Green New Deal is the legislation of indigenous communities in the United States. The Green New Deal is the legislation of the residents of Flint. The Green New Deal belongs to the people of Puerto Rico. The Green New Deal belongs to the coal miners in West Virginia. It belongs to the victims of wildfires in California. And when we center our communities and allow them to lead, anything is possible. Yeah, it's a reminder, uh, w her remarks there, uh, Mary, about the extreme weather that uh, we've been witnessing in the United States and elsewhere, like your native Australia the, these, uh, the, this past year. What is, though, this Green New Deal exactly? Well, in fact, it's called a deal. It's actually a resolution. There was 14 page of it, pages of it. The name harks back to President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, which was back in the 1930s. It was an attempt to uh, put Americans back to work during the Great Depression. This, I think it would be fair to say, is more of a list of ideas and ideals than an actual proposal. For example, as you mentioned, over the next 10 years, it involves um, getting 100% of power from renewable and clean sources. It talks about upgrading all existing buildings and new buildings to state-of-the-art uh, energy efficiency. It talks about ramping up high-speed rail to the point that air travel would be rendered obsolete, perhaps eventually. But it's more broad than that, as you touched on. This green, uh, new Green Deal spies to have a what they call a living wage job for every American who wants one. And... Broad, more broadly than that, again, it talks about universal health care for everyone. So there's no question there that is an ambitious deal, but one that is in broad strokes rather than um, mapping out specific legislation. Yeah, so resolutions, and do they go into the specifics of the cost? There's absolutely no talk of cost. There are, is a mention that it will require dramatic tax hikes, but the deal it's tax hikes, but the deal itself admits that the the cost of funding these ambitions would outweigh anything they could squeeze out of wealthy Americans, and that's perhaps one of the biggest critics of the deal. Others have cr described it as pie in the sky ambitious uh, ambitions, a um, unnecessarily long dear Santa list. On the other side, those in favour have said it's exactly what realistic environmental policy looks like. Uh, is it realistic, Kate Aronoff? 
I think it's really the only realistic plan on the table for actually dealing with the existential threat of climate change. We have not seen meaningful legislation even proposed in the United States on climate change in 10 years. Um, and as the IPCC report detailed, um, we have only about 12 years to start really stripping fossil fuels and carbon emissions from our economy. And so I think it's certainly a very ambitious plan in uh, the political moment that we're in right now. Um, but if you really look at the sort of hard science, there are um, you know, climate scientists increasingly saying we need a wartime footing to rein in carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And this is really the only plan out there to do that. Michael Schellenberg, uh, uh, you uh, two two birds with one stone here. At the, you at the same time uh, kickstart manufacturing and industry uh, while saving the planet. What's not to like? Well, there's a bunch of problems. I mean, the first is that we we did something very similar. I co-founded something called the New Apollo Project in 2003, and Obama did about $150 billion in precisely the kind of investments that the Green New Deal is calling for. A lot of that money was wasted, $24 billion for biofuels, which actually turn out to be more polluting than fossil fuels and also destroy rainforests. We did, I think, at least $15 billion on the kind of weatherization of buildings, the energy efficiency of buildings that the Green New Deal calls for. That money was almost entirely wasted. It cost twice as much to do the retrofits than we got in energy savings. And in fact, the research on energy efficiency over the last 10 years has basically shown that when energy efficiency pays for itself, it just results in people using the money they save to consume something else that increases emissions. You might save money on energy, but you might take a jet trip somewhere. Um, or if it costs more than it's worth, then you have to ask why you're doing it. Um, if you're looking to radically reduce the carbon intensity, the emissions from your energy sector, then you would just do what France did. France and Sweden are the only two countries that have uh, achieved what is called sort of complete decarbonization of their electricity supplies, and they did so with nuclear power. Um, and if you look at Germany, Germany has had the biggest Green New Deal of the last uh, couple of decades. They are going to have spent $580 billion on renewables by 2025, and emissions have not gone down since 2009. That's despite huge amounts of solar and wind, and one of the big reasons is that they've been phasing out nuclear power. So solving climate change basically just involves using nuclear rather than fossil fuels. But if you really are afraid of nuclear, you think it's something related to the bomb or that it creates a kind of way of life that people don't like, um, then you're stuck trying to do renewables, which really haven't worked to significantly reduce the carbon intensity of our energy supplies. Is that true, Walid Weslati, that renewables haven't uh, fulfilled their potential? No, I think renewables have a uh, big potential in this uh, pathway for a sustainable future. Um, we have enough uh, resources that if we mobilize this correctly in the good way, I think we, s we will solve a part of it. But it's a question of time, you know, because we are in a process to deploy a lot of financial resources, but also uh, technological science, uh, new knowledge uh, according to that. Uh, let's take the big picture on that, which is very important in my sense. Today we are in very critical situation, you know. Uh, according to all these challenges related to climate change, related to air pollution, related to bio biodiversity loss, there is a, a need, a clear need today that we mobilize new solutions. And I think this uh, Green New Deal that we talk about, it's the first time that we join the environmental agenda with the social agenda to go hand in hand uh, for a good solution. Renewable energy is part of, of that process. Yeah, that was, is that, so was that the mistake that Emmanuel Macron made? Because he raises the taxes uh, on fossil fuels, particularly on diesel, and, and that uh, the lower middle class people were like, hang on, you're squeezing us, you're not looking at the big picture, and that's what sparked the Yellow Vest movement. Well, maybe because he forgot to raise the tax on, on planes, on, on, the, on the fuel for, for plane, which, as you may know, is there is no tax on, on fuel since the 
44 and uh, Chicago Convention, if I'm correct. Um, and uh, people, when they drive their slow little diesels, they don't want to pay for the guy uh, who travel. Um, you need to know that the plane is the most used mean to travel more than 100 kilometers in France, and that 2% of the population does 50% of the trips, which is 50 billion kilometers. So it, I think it's normal that those guys, they don't want to pay for those 2% who don't pay. And not only they don't pay on, on the fuel tax, but also the CO2 emission from those, pl those planes disappear. They do not exist. So you hear Walid Westletti saying he's enthused because here finally is someone who comes up with a grand plan and that it's a start. It's a good start. You agree with that? I, I definitely agree because what, what, uh, what is important if you want to talk about environment is first to talk about social it has to be well spread across the population. And the people who should the biggest effort should be the, the people who have the more, the wealthiest. And, and the poorest, as we've seen in France, they should have a very limited impact and they don't want to pay uh, from the other. So I think this is very interesting. I've read about this new deal. I think it's, it's a really a vision for America. In practice, not everything is realistic, but this can be discussed between experts. Uh, but I think this vision is going to be important, and I think there will be a lot of debate for the next year, election 2020 in the U.S. Uh, Walid, you, you heard the argument there by Michael Schellenberger. Uh, yeah, in France, we're getting there because we use nuclear power. Yes, but at the same time, you know, there's a, uh, an interest to have the mixed energy in France. So we are in a strategy that we, we, we shift from the nuclear energy to renewable energy but this will take time because now we are really dependent on, on, on that. So I think uh, nuclear energy is not the solution per se because it's not uh, neutral from an environmental point of, of view uh, with a lot of risk and serious risk actually that we have to take in consideration. But still, uh, if tomorrow you say, okay, let's uh, stop uh, producing nuclear energy, you can, we cannot do this uh, plateau. We cannot do this discussion. That's it. Mm. It was in the wake of Donald Trump's State of the Union address that uh, Massachusetts well, we Senator... Well, we have data Ed, on this now. Uh, yeah, I was just saying it, it was in the wake of uh, uh, Donald Trump's State of the Union address that Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez jointly announced that plan last month. Energy efficiency, smart power grids, clean and affordable public transit, clean cars and manufacturing, and working with key industries to eliminate pollution. Today, we are putting forward a set of principles, not prescriptions, that will require leveraging new financing, providing new resources, and training and using existing laws and new regulations to meet our 10-year goal. So as you said at the outset, Mairead, uh, principles, not prescriptions. And he talks about this 10-year goal. There have been other big statements, right, uh, by other world leaders when it comes to uh, uh, the energy transition. How big is this one? In terms of ambitions, this is definitely up there with among the big ambitions. I've covered the, the climate change conferences for many years. I was at COP21 when all the countries came together and signed. This is, is going over and beyond this. This is really radically changing the way that America uh, treats its industrial policy. This is revamping the way that Americans think. Um, I had spoke, I was reading that in many ways, some people might see that it's retaking re the ground that Donald Trump has tried to be taking, meaning let's manufacture, we need to bring jobs back in here, we need to start working with our hands, we need to bring back those jobs that we make things here in America. And this is actually calling for that, but with a different focus. This is calling to transform the old way of think doing industrial policy and changing it to a way that has a green focus rather than doing business as usual. But Kate Aronoff, the problem in the U.S., if I'm uh, not mistaken, is that those uh, who are being squeezed out of jobs are low skilled. If uh, this Green New Deal gets put into place, should the money be in manufacturing or in education? I don't think we necessarily have to choose, right? I mean, the U.S. is one of the largest economies on Earth. We have plenty of tools to fund um, certainly something as important as 
a Green New Deal. Um, we never sort of ask how we're going to pay for, for instance, Trump's $2 trillion tax cuts, um, for $5 trillion of endless wars that we've engaged in. Um, and so I think we really, we really have to do all of the above. And as, as you mentioned before, um, to avoid what, what President Macron has faced uh, with the Yellow Vest movement, to make sure that nobody is left behind in the transition away from fossil fuels that we need to do so quickly, um, and to uh, make sure that, that folks who are going to um, be uh, pushed out, uh, unfortunately, out of um, the fossil fuel industry can have um, can have a well-paid and dignified job um, in the clean energy future. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily true that uh, these workers who are losing or might lose fossil fuel industry jobs um, are low-skilled. In fact, uh, the folks who build uh, oil pipelines, for instance, um, are in some cases the folks who build wind turbines. Um, and so I think there are plenty of opportunities for folks currently in carbon-intensive sectors uh, to transition into new work. Work and, and certainly um, the Green New Deal is interested in making that happen, and, and that should be a top priority. Uh, but uh, we're getting reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. I'll read one to you, back to you, Kate. Uh, it will succeed only the Green New Deal if the working and middle classes are fully engaged, heart, body, and soul. This necessitates shifting a good measure of wealth and power from the oligarch rulers back to the people. I see no other way. Is it going to quickly descend, Kate, into an us versus them kind of political debate? Well, I think the climate problem really is an us versus them problem, right? If you look at the fact that uh, about 100, exactly 100 uh, fossil fuel producers have been responsible for 71% uh, of emissions since 1988, um, that the wealthiest Americans are those who inordinately contribute um, to the, the carbon problem that we're currently facing, um, the lines are really very clear. And I think, you know, as, as has been brought up before in this debate, um, the middle and working classes should not be the ones who bear the burden of this transition. Um, and there's no reason and why they have to be. In fact, as the resolution for a Green New Deal states, the, uh, the Green New Deal can improve people's qualities of life, actually. And it is really fossil fuel executives um, and the sort of wealthiest Americans who are taking you know, regular transatlantic flights from London to New York um, who may have to make some sacrifices. But there's absolutely no reason why um, the folks who, who have contributed least to this crisis should be, um, should be paying for it. All right, well, I want to get Michael Schellenberger's reaction, but we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're uh, looking at the Green New Deal that's been pushed by uh, left-wing members uh, of Congress. We're talking about it uh, with uh, climate journalist uh, Kate Aronoff, who joins us from New York City. Welcome back to Michael Schellenberger, uh, who is with Forbes magazine and who is with us from Berkeley, California, here in the studio. Waleed Westlati, senior economist at the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Nicolas Melon, who is with us as well business and environment and transport uh, consultant. And uh, we want to welcome for part two of our discussion, Marianne Minesma, director of the Urgenda Foundation, which advocates for the transition towards a circular economy. Uh, what's a circular economy? Explain that to us. Circular economy uh, uses all raw materials again and again, and it's based on 100% renewable energy and also has an eye for biodiversity. So it's an integrated concept that tries to go for the new economy that we really need. All right. Well, we're going to talk more about uh, how you push for those renewable energies in a moment. First, though, I want to turn my attention to, to, to Michael Schellenberger. Uh, we were talking at, at the end of uh, part one of our discussion uh, about whether or not uh, the, the um, debate over a Green New Deal could descend as uh, us versus them, a kind of partisan divide. How, how, do, you, how do you frame this, uh, this, this uh, well, this debate? Well, there, it doesn't need to be a, a partisan divide. I mean, the, the, our largest source of zero emissions energy, the biggest contributor to preventing climate change is nuclear power. And nuclear power tends to be favored by Republicans and conservatives and climate skeptics. 
I mean, Germany has been doing a Green New Deal. It's going to have spent $580 billion by 2025. And by the end of that period, it's going to have seen its electricity prices rise 50%. German electricity is actually almost twice as expensive as French electricity. And yet German electricity produces 10 times the carbon emissions per unit of energy as French electricity. So all you need to know about solving climate change, you can learn from France and Germany. Um, there was some mention here, I think, of someone saying, well, France needs to move to renewables. Well, not for climate change. France is the model of how you deal with climate change. In fact, over the last 10 years, France has spent $33 billion trying to move to renewables by doing less nuclear. And what's happened? It's seen its electricity prices go up, and it's seen the carbon intensity of its electricity also go up. Why? Because when you, when you turn down nuclear and you try to ramp up solar and wind, which are fundamentally unreliable, they only run... 10 to 40% of the yeah, year. Yeah, except Michael, the, the, only problem, the, only problem with your, the only problem so with your argument, the nuclear, Michael, Michael, just one, one, one question about this. Uh, you know, the only problem is we, we live in a country, yeah, where nearly three quarters of the energy comes from nuclear, but there's an undue cost, which is decommissioning uh, those nuclear plants. We have an aging uh, no, it's included in the we have we have aging nuclear power yeah. plants, and it's a it's huge problem getting closing mm -hmm. them down. No, it's not actually. The cost of decommissioning, the cost of waste, is included in the price of electricity. Okay, so so you've got some of the cheapest electricity in Europe. Your electricity is almost half as expensive as Germany's, and yet your electricity is ten times um, less carbon intensive. So literally. France, like if you were to try to do, if you continue to try to do more solar and wind, you're going to increase the cost of electricity, increase the carbon intensity. And in terms of like decommissioning and waste, guess who doesn't pay for decommissioning and waste? Solar farms and wind farms. There is no solution to solar waste. Two to 300 times more solar waste is created per unit of energy than nuclear waste. And it goes to landfills and enjoys the electronic waste stream goes to poor countries where poor slum dwellers break it down and are exposed to heavy toxic metals like cadmium, chromium, and lead. So if you want to talk about like the high cost of, of, of decommissioning old plants, you should be worried about solar and wind farms because the cost of doing that for nuclear in France is already included in the price of electricity. Is that true, Nicolas Mello? Yeah, well, I would like to step back a bit because I think uh, we're talking about nuclear. It's good. It's 5% it's of the primary energy. So I'd rather focus on what is important uh, do you know what is the most important contribution on France on the climate change? Our contribution, 55%, is our imports. Why? Because we live in a world made of coal. Okay? And this is the problem. Coal is 40% uh, of the CO2 emission, and it's 60% of the increase since 2000. And every year, every, every COP, we say, why CO2 is increasing? Because what we did in France... We closed the factory in France, which used nuclear, and we opened them in Eastern Europe and in China, which is made out of coal. So as long as the key message for a politician is not get rid of coal, however you do it, nothing is going to change. And we, we are all on the same vessel in, on this planet. So I like this plan in the US. I like this new deal. But I, co I couldn't see the world coal. I mean, 100% renewable is a nice target. It's not going to be, it, it was what we did 300 years ago. The world was 100% renewable, but we didn't have the same way of life. And we're going to have to accept that to get to 100% renewable, we have to divide by two, three, four, how we live. And this is where the Gilets jaunes problem occurs. It's not necessarily going to be easy. So just to, to stay back, I Yikes. think if we really want to change Nobody something. Wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that, but it's not about willing, willing to do that. I mean, coal is one problem, oil is the other one. We're going to have this peak oil coming by 2025. And the U.S. is the first country will be the most impacted because okay. there are only gilets jaunes in the U.S. because they can only move if they have a car. In France, we have the train, we have the transport, we have something else. In the U.S., they're going to be very, very impacted. 
And they have to anticipate this and to find some solution to reduce the 20 millions of barrels of oil that they use every day. But once you have made a change, your life is much cheaper. I drive an electric car for since 2008, so more than 10 years now. It's much cheaper once you have it. So it's merely how can you help... Cost more up front, though. Uh, yeah, so how can mm. you help people to make those costs up front? Because you will make up for them later. We help people uh, making their houses energy neutral, so without an energy bill. Uh, it costs roughly in the Netherlands 35,000 euros mm -hmm. for a house. That's also what they pay on energy in 15 years time. So if you help them with the financial means, they can pay it back in 15 years for the same amount per month as they now pay on energy. So there's plenty of solutions which don't have yeah. to cost additionally. The Netherlands, which is talking about carbon neutral rail lines. They are already, yes. And uh, But can that work when you have high speed rail like you do in France and like they want to do in, in California where Michael is? It, it will take a little bit more windmills, but uh, yes, of course. There is plenty of space, there's plenty of sun and wind. It's merely, you have to take the investment at a certain point of time and ride it off over 20, 25 years. But it's not a problem that it's, that it's not there. We just have to make the choice. What do we want? spend trillions on climate damages, which will come if we don't change, or invest now. And the investments now are lower than the cost that we will have later. But we don't want to see this. M Michael Schellenberger, you, you agree with that? Probably not. I mean, we, this is just, I mean, there's actually real world evidence here. So Germany, as it's transitioned to solar and wind, has seen its electricity prices go up 50%. That's actually that's actually included in the recent OECD report on Germany. Um, the only places that have decarbonized transportation at significant levels are places that have done so with nuclear. You mentioned high-speed rail. High-speed rail in nuclear is zero emissions uh, transportation. In fact, the only cases where we've significantly decarbonized transportation is with nuclear. So it's not like th this data is not like, it's not mysterious. When you add more renewables to your grid, electricity costs must go up. And that's a function of the unreliability of solar and wind. This is very well documented by an economist in Germany who's not particularly pro-nuclear at all, um, Leon Hirth. And he documents how for every 15 to 40% of solar and wind that you add to the grid, the value must go down by around half other data, because so. you're always having to run some other source of power whenever the sun goes behind a cloud or the wind or, or the wind stops blowing. So if you just need an example of how not to deal with climate change, Germany's emissions are 10 times more carbon or Germany's mm -hmm. electricity is 10 times more carbon intensive than France's. And it spends um, almost twice as much on electricity. What else do you need to know? All right. Uh, the Germans call it Energiewende. That's uh, energy transition in German. In 2017, they used one third less energy. They were less energy intensive than the U.S., with the Germans paying, yes, two and a half times more than Americans for their energy. As Michael rightly points out, uh, utility bills are more expensive in Germany. Uh, but the U.S. produces a whopping 64 percent more coal per person. That's according to the Global Energy Statistics Yearbook. Uh, Walid Weslati, what's, what's a bit frustrating in these discussions is everybody can bring out their own facts, their own statistics that, yeah. the, to, to make their point. When you look at the mix, again, we were talking here about a, a, a Green New Deal. When you look at the grand plan, how do you do this transition? I think which is needed is uh, a deep behavioral change that we have, because even in our discussion and the way how we address and we focus on the nuclear energy means that we didn't get clearly the, the scope of the, and the magnitude of the challenge that we are heading now. It's, it's important uh, at that time to um, just to stress the fact that uh, we should exit any dependency for nuclear, for fossil, for anything. So we should think that uh, nuclear depends also on natural resources, uranium. And if you think about the, the long run, uh, the future, it's not the future, it's not uh, next year, right? the future is, uh, is, 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 uh, is many decades from now. And uh, the, the, the needs of uh, the world population in terms of electricity, energy, will increase according to the demographic, demographic trends here and there. And I think we should be confident because we have many ways 
to explore mainly re related to our capacity to, to innovate. Innovate in our cities and our urban settlements. Uh, one of uh, the main problems that we had uh, in many uh, developed countries, but also in developing countries, if the trend will continue like this, that we have this kind of uh, very sprawled city, making people car dependent. That, uh, and making also any investment in okay, public transport, something would be very, very expensive. You touch on something crucial here, Walid, which is at what level do we need these Green New Deals or these grand plans? Is it at the regional level? Right now there's big uh, infrastructure plans here for the greater Paris area. Is it at the national level? Or if you're sitting on this continent, is it at the level of the European Union that this has to happen? I think both. Both, uh, I think, uh, international, regional, and even local level, uh, because we are now heading for um, a kind of claim for local democracy. Can a Green New Deal, like, for instance, come from the French president, or does it have to come from the European Union? I think have to come from people before. This is very important. You cannot do... Uh, I have problem. We cannot do actually uh, the uh, environmental transition without people. People have to be a partner and the convinced partner, I would say even the driver of the tra transition. And this needs actually that we, uh, we do the debate at the local level with people to understand first what's this global challenges that we are talking about and then translate this in uh, public policies. Mariam Minesma, you're here in Paris because there is a conference taking place at Paris City Hall, uh, Justice for Climate, it's called. Uh, there's a second one taking place, Women for Climate, on, on Thursday. Um, yeah, it's, you know, the lo a lot of people, they look at these local initiatives, they see it basically as a reaction to Donald Trump because he's walked away from the uh, Paris uh, uh, Climate Change Agreement. But... Can it happen really at the local level that this, that something as grand as the, as the plan that's touted right now by progressives in the United States can be in, in implemented? I think we need many levels. Uh, very often you do need a local level to understand it and to do it. But someone else usually comes up with a plan because you cannot expect from someone being a baker or something to invent the energy system for, in my case, the Netherlands. So you should have other people who invent what it could look like and then go into debate. What we do at the local level is show the people, well, this is your region. Uh, what do you want? You don't want windmills? Fine. But then you have so many hectares of solar panels. Oh, you don't want that? Okay, then we do five windmills. Then we have lots of... Le so the people have an idea of what it means to choose for the one or the other. But they have to choose. You cannot simply say we don't want anything. What has happened the past 25 years. Because that's what happens here, by the way, in France. Yeah, well, then they don't understand really what climate change will, um, will affect in the next 50 years. If you really would see it, you would choose. I, I don't think the, that people, uh, even what happened in France, that people are not considering the problem of climate change. And actually, just as uh, we, we transform the, the debate from a uh, debate on tax and the tax burden on people uh, without talking clearly about why we are doing the, this, uh, this kind of tax. Uh, because people can see the, the importance of this environmental issues for, the, for their future, for the future of their kids. And I think if you do a survey, you will ask people and they will say the same thing. However, maybe they think that uh, we should do it differently that the way what people are claiming is more social uh, justice before the environmental issues. Kate Aronoff, let, let's, uh, I'm not going to let you off the hook here. Let's talk about politics for a second. Uh, the bill for this Green New Deal, the uh, uh, leader of the Senate says he's going to let it come up for a, for a vote very soon. It could even happen this, this week. What's going to happen to this, to this proposal? We'll see. It remains to be seen exactly how this vote will go. Um, but one thing is overwhelmingly clear is that uh, the American people support a Green New Deal. About 81 percent of American and American voters uh, are supportive of the provisions of a Green New Deal. And I think what this vote, uh, if it you know does not turn out that the Senate votes for uh, the Green New Deal, may may show is that there are. 
uh, millions of dollars in fossil fuel donations sloshing around our political system and keeping us from actually having a real conversation about climate change and the kinds of disinformation that have been pumped into Republican legislative offices um, are still very much at work. And so I don't, uh, I don't think uh, you know the the result of this uh, of this vote will say one way or, an, or another. Uh, if Americans are ready for a Green New Deal, I think that's overwhelmingly clear that we are. Um, but I think it's, you know, a show of cowardice on the part of, of the part of Mitch McConnell, um, in part because, you know, they have done this before. Um, when the Kyoto Protocols came up for a vote, they um, sent it to a vote um, before anyone sort of had a chance to talk about it. And so this is a, a known tactic. Um, and I think, you know, we really sort of have to keep a firm eye on just how much money um, Republican politicians and even some Democratic politicians are getting from um, the fossil fuel industry and sort of always keep that in mind in that debate and that, you know, there have been studies saying that in the United States, we don't have a real democracy, we have an oligarchy. Um, and I think that are the sort of conditions that we're working with, whether we like it or not. Michael Schellenberger, when we on this side of the Atlantic uh, watched the presidential debates in 2016, we saw how little uh, the environment came up uh, as a topic. Is it going to be the same the next time around in 2020? Probably. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, I mean, the pu public opinion on climate change has basically been the same for like 20 or 30 years. There's, there's support for doing something about it. It's not particularly strong. Um, you know, it's hard to take... I think if you want to know why Republicans in the United States often think that climate change is a hoax, part of it is because the people that are calling for action, dramatic action on climate change, are also trying to shut down our largest source of clean energy, which it's is nuclear power. So how do you square that house. circle? You have um, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez comes out and she says the Green New Deal is going to include a transition away from nuclear, which is about two thirds of our clean energy to solar and wind, which every time that occurs results in higher emissions. Emissions go up every time we close nuclear plants because we don't replace them with solar and wind because they're unreliable. And you start to think, is this really about the climate actually, if they're trying to do something on the one hand that would actually increase emissions? Or is this about actually supporting a bunch of interest groups that wanna do that want to get money for installing solar panels and retrofitting buildings? maybe it doesn't really have to do with climate change. So if you want to know who has fed the cynicism that has been bred in the United States, and I think in Europe, you know, how do you take seriously somebody who says the world will end if we don't cut emissions, and then they're out there trying to shut down nuclear plants? It doesn't make any sense. Kate, Kate um, Aronoff, Kate Aronoff, let me, let me hear Kate on sense. this. Go ahead, when Kate. When I pointed this out, when she came out yeah. with the deal, it became a small crisis within the Democratic Party. Excuse me. Um, yeah, the reason that this Republicans needs to be are for. And, and I think the guests who kind of go, oh, the decommissioning oh. costs. Wait, well, one at a time. Kate, Kate Aronoff. The materials throughput, it's all lower. If I could, if I could butt in, uh, yeah, the reason that the Republican Party is denying climate change is because they've been paid to do so. There is well-documented evidence that the fossil fuel industry has fed disinformation campaigns for decades um, and produced a lot of misinformation about climate change. And I think it's frankly a conspiracy theory to say that Green New Deal advocates are just looking out for the interests of solar producers or something like that. Um, when we have $20 billion every year going to the fossil fuel industry in the form of subsidies, uh, $5 trillion a year annually at the global level, if you're to believe the IMF on that, um, I think it's to ignore the sort of role of the fossil fuel industry in this conversation, I think is irresponsible. And it's, it's really just delved into conspiracy theories. A, a group of senior economists from both political parties uh, are uh, have come out against uh, a Green New Deal. Instead, they are pushing for a $40 a ton carbon tax. Uh, they include the former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, who told the Financial Times uh, this week how uh, we, uh, who, who told the Financial Times this week, let me find my notes here, um, uh, who, uh, is, this is a plan that harnesses markets, she says, it is much more efficient and less costly than methods proposed by proponents of the Green New Deal. Carbon tax, Nicolas Mélan. Well, a carbon tax could be something uh, interesting if it's uh, implemented across the world. 
if you only implement it in, in one country and not the other one, then obviously you're going to penalize yourself and your, your own industry. But coming back on the cost side of things, um, um, uh, I, I, a lot of people say it's, it's cost, it's very expensive, how do we finance it? But people tend to forget that we've put a couple of thousands of billion dollars to save the banks, to save the financial system. And now we are asking, look, we need a couple of thousand billion dollars to save the climate and to well. save the humanity. <laughs> and people say, but we don't have the money. Fair enough. <laughs> but what, what do we do next? It's about, it's not about the planet. It's about us. It's about our children. It's about saving us. It's not a, it's not a money problem. The, the Fed has $4,500 billion in a set. And she can, she's been printing money as, as high as $1,000 billion per year. There's no money problem. This money goes to Wall Street now. Yeah. We just need to put it in the energy transition, and we're all better off. And on the nuclear side, I would tend to agree with Michael. If all those people who fight against nuclear, if we had the same against coal, we'd be much better off. Because it's a choice. Do we start by ending nuclear, or do we start by ending coal? Uh, we can agree that we need to end both of them. But in terms of priority for the climate, mm. probably we need to end coal first, which was what decided uh, Angela Merkel back in 2010. And she said, look, we postponed the nuclear phase-out plan and we, closed the, and we closed the coal plant first. And then when Fukushima six months later, and she changed back the plan again. But yeah, it's a green of priority. If we do nuclear and, and Germany coal... Germany say that the, those coal plants are there, they're just across the border in Poland. Yeah, exactly. But what I say is we are not going to be able to close both uh, nuclear and coal. And this is the debate we are seeing in France now. Hmm. This is the deal. We can't close everything at the same time. Otherwise, it's an energy collapse and the, final, the system collapse. Hmm. So, Marianne Menesma, uh, let's speak practically here. How fast do you go towards 100% renewables as, as uh, is touted uh, in this Green New Deal proposal? Well, we are not going fast enough, but in principle, we could be there within 15 years if we really wanted to. And for the Netherlands, it would cost roughly 1.5% of the GDP on all annual uh, writing off uh, combined. One and a half a year? 1.5% of the GDP a year for the next 15 years would be enough. So I think as a rich country, we would be able to do that and we should do that. It's not an enormous amount. Uh, it's mainly an investment into the future, but once you have it there, you don't have any marginal cost anymore, and we will end up with a system that's three billion cheaper than if we would go on with fossil fuel. And it would be great because I think Netherlands imports a lot of coal electricity from uh, Germany. Sometimes we do. We also have still five coal-fired power plants, yeah. but because we won the climate case, they might have to close them. Walid Westlati, is the conversation changing at the OECD? Yes, overall... overall uh, and, and I guess my question is, how much since 2015? It's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, but just uh, let me react to the question regarding carbon tax. I think uh, the problem with carbon tax is that uh, when you ask people to pay their contribution to, uh, to the environment, our common good, uh, as we said, uh, and they don't have the alternative to change behavior. If you are car dependent, as I said, uh, you are living in very um, far away Remote from places. job centers, etc., and you are dependent on your car, and then you, you, we ask you to pay. It's not the sense of the carbon tax. The carbon tax is to give incentive to people to change their behavior, to make things their mobility d d d different. For this reason, I think, uh, which is uh, the high priority uh, uh, to make it possible and efficient is to invest massively in uh, public transport, shared mobility, soft mobility, this kind of things mm -hmm. that give people uh, idea about it. Another point is how, Very we use, we're out of time. Yeah, how we use the revenue of this ca tax carbon. Because if this tax carbon revenue are injected in the budget, government budget, and we don't know where, where it goes, then people can ask the question, why you are doing that reform in that sense and you don't uh, take the money from other side? And this is very important that you have to think when you talk about carbon tax about two criteria. The first one, where the money go, if it goes to investment in public transport or other things, and the second thing that 
you have to take on consideration right. the regressive aspect of an accountable transition is what you're arguing for Walid Westlati I want to thank you I want to thank as well uh, Nicolas Melon and Marianne uh, Menesma for being with us. I want to thank uh, from Berkeley, California, Michael uh, Schellenberger, and from New York City, Kate Aronoff. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.